Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel for yet another Retro Console Breakdown, where today we're going to tackle one of the most ambitious and frequently requested pieces of hardware from the mid-2000s, the PS3 CPU, the Cell Broadband Engine Processor. If you've ever been puzzled as to why the PS3 was such a powerhouse for its era, but likewise made a lot of developers want to tear their hair out trying to code for it, then you'll be happy to know that this breakdown will provide a little bit of insight on all of that. But before we begin, if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing, that way you'll catch my weekly uploads. And if you like this video at all, make sure to annihilate the like button, that way YouTube will actually share it to other people who enjoy it as well. Now let's just dive right into the content and set some context with how the Cell CPU was made. Back in the early 2000s, Sony, IBM, and Toshiba teamed up to make an alliance to birth the Cell Broadband Engine, a true supercomputer on a chip designed for everything from immersive gaming to scientific crunching and high-def video handling. It was clocked at 3.2 gigahertz, and it made its big debut in the PlayStation 3 in 2006 as the first mass market rollout. What really set it apart was its emphasis on massive parallel processing, boosting a theoretical peak of over 200 gigaflops of performance. But unlike these straightforward multi-core setups, we see in modern CPUs, or even the PS3's competition, the Xbox 360, and its more conventional triple core design at the time, the cell was a whole different animal completely. It operated like a network on chip, with everything linked through a clever bus system, as opposed to an SOC, or system on chip, that we would normally expect to see. This made it a dream for demands of realistic graphics, physics simulations, and even AI during that era, but it also threw up some serious programming challenges that devs had to wrestle with. At the heart of the cell is the power processing element or PPE. You can think of this as the leader of the pack, handling general purpose tasks and keeping the whole show coordinated. It's actually divided into two main parts, the Power PC Processing Unit, or PPU, and the Power PC Processor Storage Subsystem, or PPSS. The PPU is a solid 64-bit processor built on the Power PC ISA version 2.02, or industry standard architecture. It was souped up with vector simmed multimedia extensions, or VMXs, which was IBM's attempt of advanced parallel number crunching technology. It's pretty similar to the PowerPC cores in the Xbox 360 itself, and even the older Macs, making it seem like a familiar CPU core. The PPU runs exclusively in Big Endian mode, which simply puts stores data with the largest ends first, hence where the big part of Big Endian comes from, and aligns with how humans typically write numbers and dates, and throws in optional floating point square root operations for that extra bit of mathematical power. Tying it all together is that PPSS, which delivers a general 512 kilobytes of L2 cache for quick data grabs, keeping things humming along without constantly tripping to slower main memory with the RAM. Diving deeper into the PPU, it's a dual-threaded processor, which means it can juggle two threads simultaneously, almost as if there were two physical cores, even though there's only one. And in prime conditions, it can even dish out up to four instructions per cycle thanks to dual issuing. It's equipped with a 32 kilobyte L1 instruction cache and matching 32 kilobyte L1 data cache to minimize the delays. The instruction cache stores recently used program instructions, like code snippets from games or even the operating system, and prevents the CPU from constantly fetching them from this slower main memory that the PS3 had. The data cache does the same, but just for data values that the instructions themselves operate on, like numbers, variables, or game states. The pipeline starts at 12 stages, but can dynamically stretch to 24 for the more tricky or advanced operations. The 12 pipelines work like an assembly line in a factory, and breaks down the process of executing an instruction into smaller steps, otherwise known as stages, that can also overlap. For example, while one instruction is being decoded or figured out, another might be fetched or loaded, and a third might be executed or calculated. This pipelining boosts efficiency by allowing the CPU to work on multiple instructions simultaneously, increasing throughput or instructions per second. In the PS3, this helps with the multitasking, like running AI calculations in-game while handling audio or the physics. All in all, ensuring smooth operation and handling of complex code. Then there are the specialized units like the fixed point integer unit, or the FXU, which tackles basic arithmetic like addition and bitwise operations, and is a dedicated hardware block inside the PPU altogether. This FXU supports the PPU's role as the brain, coordinating with the console's synergistic processing elements, 
for parallel tasks, but I'll get into that in a moment. Then there are the vector scalar units, or VSUs, which dives into floating point and vector work for the PPU, and is also another specialized hardware block. It does the scalar operations through single value calculations, like basic floating point math, and it does the vector operations by processing multiple values at once, like an array of numbers, which is great for parallel computing like graphics or physics simulations, which the PlayStation Cell CPU is all about. These were all complete with IEEE 754 compliant FPUs that manage both single and double precision for everything from quick graphics math to precise simulations. Of course, the PPU doesn't fly solo. It's the central hub in the cell's architecture, delegating heavy lifting to the synergistic processing elements that I just mentioned, or SPEs. These assistants, as I'm going to keep referring them as, amp up the parallel processing power of the PlayStation 3. They are what transform the PlayStation 3 CPU from a basic power PC setup into a multimedia monster, often earning the cell its 1 plus 7 core label that it has, as in 1 PPU plus 7 SPEs. Technically, the chip is fabricated with eight physical SPEs on the die, but one gets disabled during manufacturing to boost yields, such as if an SPE turns out defective, they can just sideline it without tossing the whole processor itself. This leaves seven working SPEs in total, but the PlayStation 3's operating system reverves one for hypervisor duties like security and redundancy, meaning developers and games usually get six to play with. Each SPE is a lean, mean, and independent unit built for high throughput and data parallel jobs, basically simmed operations where one instruction hammer multiple data points at once, like what's found in GPUs. And unlike your everyday general purpose CPU cores, they skip traditional cache memory and branch predictions, zeroing in on pure computational grunt for vector math. That's what makes them perfect for graphics rendering, 3D models or slapping on shaders, physics simulations, from crunching collision math or even fluid dynamics, audio tweaks, encryption, video decoding, there's a lot that these SPEs could do, and really left it up to the developer on how to use them. Now the real workhorse inside of each SPE that makes them work the way they do is the Synergistic Processing Unit, or SPU. It runs proprietary risk or reduced instruction set computing based SIMD instruction sets backed by 128 registers that operated at a 128 bit and can pack vectors of 32 bit or 16 bit values for floating point or fixed point operations. There's 256 kilobytes of single ported local store, a blazing fast SRAM that serves as both code and data memory, not to be confused like cache memory, but still provides direct memory access, and is one of the things that make it different from a typical CPU. It also has no dynamic branching prediction or built-in memory management in general, which keeps things efficient but demands careful planning from programmers to avoid bottlenecks. Execution split across two different pipelines. The odd one manages load and store operations, shuffling and vector rotation through the SPU load and store unit, or SLS, and a fixed point unit. The even one crunches arithmetic, logic, floating point via another FXU and an FPU. That FPU supports single precision, double precision, and integer operations, sticking mostly to those IEEE standards, but with some performance tweaks like custom rounding or denominal handling to keep things speedy for real world tasks. So obviously the PPE and the SPE are both different, yet they still need to work together to get the job done. So what exactly are these differences more in detail and how do they still work together even with those said differences? Well, the main difference between the PPE and the SPEs come down to their roles and design philosophies. The PPE is your versatile all-rounder that has full memory management, branch prediction, easy shared system access, making it perfect for unpredictable control-focused code like game logic or operating system stuff, like a regular CPU would be. The SPEs on the flip side are pure specialists, isolated setups with no shared memory, totally reliant on direct memory access for data shuffling, and tuned for straight line, predictable, simmed workloads that blast through huge data sets. This asymmetry was genius for power efficiency and raw flops, but it was a nightmare for these devs that came from symmetric and typical multiprocessing core systems where everything was interchangeable. You see, SPEs required hands-on data management and aren't cut out for general operating system tasks, so transitioning code typically meant a ton of rewrites. And then you obviously had to optimize what these SPEs did in the particular title or game and how to get that all up and running. And that's why there are examples of games from that generation where a game title would run and or look better on an Xbox 360 because the developer didn't give the kind of TLC to the SPEs that the Cell CPU and the PS3 needed to really run on par and to exceed what the Xbox 360 was capable of processor wise. And even working together, it got pretty complicated. The PPE was the conductor and it loads the code 
load onto the SPEs, scouts for parallel friendly segments, like lighting calculations or collision checks, and dispatches them out to the SPEs. Data then gets direct memory access straight to each SPE's local SRAM store. They grind away in parallel together, leveraging that four single precision floats per simmed performance I teased earlier, and then direct memory access the results back. The communication with the PPE and the SPEs is done through signals for alerts or shared memory queues. The glue holding it all together is the Element Interconnect Bus, or EIB, a 1.6 gigahertz ring bus with a theoretical whopping 204.8 gigabytes a second of bandwidth, using command credits and tokens to keep traffic flowing without any jams in the memory system. Programming approaches vary too, with PPE-centric models having PPE-boosting pipelines or services, which were simpler for starters, while SPE-centric ones let SPEs grab tasks on their own for max efficiency. In optimized games like Uncharted, The Last of Us, Kill Zones 2 and 3, this unlocked mind-blowing effects and graphical abilities that was not possible in any other console at the time, or would have been possible for the PS3 if they opted to not go with the Cell processor. In the end, the Cell was a gutsy leap into heterogeneous computing that didn't go mainstream, but definitely left an incredible mark on processor designs. It was definitely ambitious for its time, but came with a lot of criticism due to the complexity. Again, a game not properly optimized for the Cell processor and the PPE and the SPEs inside of it typically ran at worst performance compared to the Xbox 360, and only in examples where the developer took the time to optimize at least somewhat for the SPEs was that a different story. I mean, again, look at Killzone 2, where it's said to be around 60% of the SPEs are only utilized in this title. So imagine if they were able to get a full 100%, what they could do on a game that still looks really good and holds up really well today and was mesmerizing back then. But guys, that's all I really have for you in today's video. This is a really complex topic, and the more I kept researching on the Cell CPU, the more it felt like I was chasing my tail. Learning one thing made me realize I didn't learn enough about the prior thing that I thought I had learned enough of, and it was a constant back and forth, and I only have a few hours every weekday sacrificing a couple of other things in order to sit down and do this type of research. And as I mentioned in my last few videos, I will be leaving on vacation, so I don't have a lot of time because there's so much I need to get done before I leave, but there was a lot of people who were really looking forward to this video, so I figured getting it out with what I knew, with the details that I had, would be better than waiting at least another three weeks before putting something out. Anyway, I'm starting to ramble again, which reminds me, if you are part of my ramble squad and you're still listening to me go right now, please shout out down below that you stuck around to the end of this video because I consider you a top tier supporter and I appreciate you so much. I hope you guys all have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on when you watch this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.